Hello, shalom. Shalom uvracha. Uvracha, shalom, shalom. Chag sameach, chag or sameach. I don't think we ever spoke before. We didn't. I was just thinking, wow, I think we've only traded comments on Facebook posts and and uh, a couple of things like that. I don't think we've ever actually spoken. Cool. I was trying to remember if we ever had. I don't think we have. Shalom, shalom. How are you doing? I am just getting settled. I just moved back to the U.S. Wow. So you were here again? Because I thought, I thought you were in the U.S. <laughs> I moved back to the to Israel, planning to do my masters there, but I moved back planning to come back. And basically, when I decided that it wouldn't be um, necessary to do a masters, I don't think it's worth the time and the money. Uh, then I decided right. to come ahead and go ahead and come back to the U.S. Yep. Cool. Uh, you know, I can't believe we never got together. I, actually, I remember thinking about it once. I think I did know you were here a couple, maybe a half a year ago. How long have you been? Were you I was here? there for nine months. Nine months, okay. Yeah. So I think it must have been when you just got back, and I never got around to it. So I do apologize for that. Ah. So I, I am one of uh, a people without a land for a land without a people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we pretty much all choose what the combination of sacrifices <laughs> are today. <laughs> Is there's a smorgasbord of various sacrifices you can choose, and uh, you know that basically that's what we do is we just choose the particular one from column A and two from column B kind of thing. Um, so tell so tell me about your uh, your views about the place of the land of Israel in relation to the Jewish faith and like the right the differences between converts and someone who's born in with a, sta a Jewish legal status. I think that's right. sort of the focus that we were planning Right, this with. is the thing I've been wanting to also take up with Asher for a while because I listen to his videos and... Uh, just know I don't even, represent him. Yeah. I mean, no, I understand I've, you're not. I'm, not, I'm just saying, I'm, this is a... Well, to tell you the truth, it, it's not just about him because this is obviously something... I mean, I'm sure, I know you've been involved, if I'm not mistaken, in commenting on this whole thing of the Gare movement with, with uh, Dave Katz and Actually, Chaim Actually, probably not. I've, I've only vaguely okay. heard of it, and I don't know so much about it. So it, it's, it's a burning issue. Um, actually, it's probably, I would say, it's becoming more uh, burning, but it's been a burning issue for a while since the whole Ten Tribes thing got started. Uh, as far as I can tell, I mean, you know, certainly over the last 15 or 20 years, Various groups have jumped on this wagon of, you know, the Ten Tribes, and I've met numerous converts that, you know, it wasn't just enough that they converted. They basically felt like they were coming home, that they must be part of the Ten Tribes. Right. And um, they put too much stock in ancestral, like, genetic ancestry. <laughs> right. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, it's really two things. It's also a spiritual thing for a lot of these people. I mean, I have a very dear friend who was a convert who, um, you know, just feels very strongly about this. And I don't really think that it, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, she doesn't take it as being like a, a genetic thing per se. She actually sees it as much more also of a spiritual thing. And that's actually part of, you know, what I want to. To, to bring up here, okay. but, um, you know, yes, I mean, the fact is that there are people who I believe stress overly uh, a genetic issue. I personally um, believe, first of all, that there is a race issue, there's a nation issue. All of these attributes can be discussed to varying degrees. Um, uh, although I do also believe, and I think it's important to, you know, which one of the things that I respect people that bring it up, I do believe that the teachings of God are obviously for the whole world, for all of humanity. All of humanity is the creation of God. The question is, you know, what are the circumstances? How does it work? What's the what's for the best? And um, you know, I you can take it either way. I mean, personally, I in my more cynical moments would say things like well to tell you the truth all of humanity is messed up you know including the jewish people well, you know, are, are we i don't really understand where where you come from are you talking about 
um, what to make of the current reality or like the current norms and perceptions among the Jewish people, or are you talking about what the Torah's intention is? Well, I haven't was talking about any of that. I'm just mentioning it as a as a you know as a general throwouts at the okay. moment. I personally believe that when we approach the Torah, uh, we do have to ask the question: Can we ascertain what God's intentions seem to be? A. Is there a nation? B. Does that nation have some special status? Mm -hmm. C. How do how does the convert fit into that? And then finally, how does the rest of humanity fit into that? That's the way I've broken it down. All right. Um, okay. So, Bekitzur, I'll just jump on and say I do believe that there is a nation, and I believe that the, that God makes it clear in the Torah that His plan operates through a nation, meaning that he, po he chose Avraham for the reasons that the Torah outlines, and the entire plan was therefore shaped to fit Avraham and his circumstances and the nation that came from his loins, and then everything fits into that as time goes on. And I happen to think that that not only is scripturally provable, I believe it's logical and reasonable as well, to see how that it would be necessary for there to be a nation that was chosen to stand for a certain something, um, then I do believe that it's important to ask the question, so what about everybody else, you know, going to the opposite extreme? And I do believe that there's what to say about what the everybody else is, meaning that I don't believe that just because there's a Jewish nation, and I don't even, to tell you the truth, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't like using the term Jewish for this because it's not about Jewish. It's about Torah. Right. So, you know, there is a Torah nation. There is supposed to be a Torah nation. And everything else fits itself in conjunction with that concept of the Torah nation. That's, if I could put it in the most general but, you know, clear terms, that's what I believe. Now, um,. One of the things that, for, so I mentioned this concept of the Gare movement that this uh, Dave Katz got started. Basically, he didn't really, um, it's not an absolutely novel idea by him, but essentially what he has gone on record as saying is that there are really four branches to the nation of Israel. There is Kohen, Levi, Yisrael, and then what he calls Gare or Gare Toshav, uh, but he's gone on record as saying things like a person doesn't actually have to convert. If they just accept the Torah, then they become automatically of Ger, and they're inherently equal to any of the other three branches of the nation. What is equal in what way? Well, he says everything. He actually recently went on record on a video of saying that he believes that a Ger can marry a Jew. Oh. Uh, on Israel, on Israelite. You, you're talking. Not, you're not talking about a normative gear. Normative I'm not talking convert. about normative convert. Right. No, I'm not talking. About, he actually believes that if, if, um, let's say that you know Mary Beth Johnson woke up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, on any given Monday morning, and she said, "I'm accepting the Torah of God upon myself." She automatically becomes this thing called gear, and that she could even marry uh, a born Israelite. So I and actually her, recall reading, I believe it's in Yisrael Biyah, but I cannot tell you off the top of my head exactly where. Um, but in the in the place where the Rambam discusses the prohibition of intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews, and his wording there does seem, and I'm saying this as someone who's completely unfamiliar with this movement you're talking about, Right. his wording there does insinuate to me that he was under the impression that the prohibition against intermarriage with a non-idolater is rabbinic. Okay, that would be correct, except there's one problem. To say something, the prohibition is only rabbinic, does not mean to say obviously. that it's, a, that it's obviously. tar. Obviously, or, but that's an entirely... Or B, also, we haven't right. established whether it's only rabbinic. I'm just saying, it. No, I, I, I can see where there might be such a... I mean, if you're no, looking you at see, the straightforward text of the Torah by itself, it really emphasizes um, intermarriage with I, I, idolatrous people. So. And and that would that would make perfect sense that the that the at least one opinion would say that the main the main goal was to prohibit 
marrying idolaters because. But, but, but then on, on the flip side, will you go ahead and finish your thought? I was so. just to say, but that's not to say that just because that's that's the actual prohibition that if if Mary Beth Johnson then went and married an Israelite, that her children would also be considered Israelites. Right. Or so, that it, it would not engage in uh, other issues. So I was going to say that um, even if that's the case, that perhaps on a technicality, the Torah's prohibition is only with regard to marrying idolaters and that any other stringency is rabbinic, that doesn't take away from the fact that in the overall context of the, of the Torah, of the language of the Torah, if someone is not an idolater, if they've taken it upon themselves to follow the God of Israel, they are going to follow through with joining the people of Israel. There's no nothing that should hold them back from doing that. Why would they want to make any such distinction? Which really brings me to the to the conclusion that it, the entirety of of such a movement springs out of a reaction to how difficult and messed up how 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 complicated modern orthodox I don't mean modern orthodoxy as a movement, but orthodoxy in our time has made conversion. In other words, 100%. I think, I think I would agree with this you movement wouldn't even exist if uh, if if there weren't such problems. And I think we both know from listening to you before that, regardless of particular details of how to do it, I th I'm pretty sure we both agree that the way of relating to potential converts and the way in which it's drawn out is not in accord with Jewish sources. With Torah sources, 100%. I agree with you. Whether rabbinic that, uh, or biblical. Right. You know. No, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, you could call it the levels of corruption. I mean, I, I would go that sin, far. Sin bege begetteth sin. <laughs> right. No, 100%, because ultimately when we talk about the nation, we have to recognize that, that there are, um, there's an idea in, in Hashkafa that says, that there's mitzvah, there's mutar, and then there's avera. That the actions that a man can involve himself in can be broken down grossly into three categories. The things that are mitzvah to do, that which is simply permissible to do, meaning you're not obligated necessarily to do it. It's not a mitzvah, it's not a command of God, but one can choose to do it. And then there's avera, that there's that which is forbidden to do. And I believe very strongly that when we talk about the path to God and in, in, from a Torah perspective, we can also show that um, people can actually take mitzvah and corrupt it into something which is, you know, veritably, if not already in a vera, then on the on that level, I agree with you. I think. Well, the way that they relate to the conversion process is not even a mitzvah. It's not a mitzvah. <laughs> That's the thing. It's not a mitzvah. It, I mean, first of all, to convert is a, I would say to convert is a mitzvah. You even have, at least in the rabbinic tradition, because you have in the blessing for converting, for for circumcising converts, who commanded us to circumcise converts. But I mean, the way in which they do the conversion process. Is not it's a totally command. Out, it yeah. seems to no, totally, totally an avera. Yeah. Not even. First <laughs> like, of all, I mean, the irony is. If you talk to, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this, but I actually have empirical evidence this is true. If you talk to Rabbanim involved in conversion, the vast majority of them will say that they, it makes it so hard to protect the Jewish nation so that, you know, people that aren't fit get in. And yet I can tell you quite honestly, after 40 plus years of experience with this, that all the time I see people allowed to convert that aren't, quote, Mid fit to be in, allowed in. And good people are chased away. Exactly. I saw this during them. my own conversion. I saw women who the rabbi clearly knew, and it was known to everybody, that certain women who were going through a conversion process and passed me up, they were only converting in order to marry. They had of no course. original. And then with myself, they dropped me. In, when I was converting through the Chicago Rabbinical Council um, under a rabbi in Louisiana. Uh, he's no longer there, thank goodness, but now he's messing up some other place probably. But uh, <laughs> they, they dropped me because I could not swear to them that I would always go by Ashkenazi custom. Right. Uh, I mean, I listen, we, could, we could write absurd. books. 
we could write books and books and books of stories like this. I, I mean, I'll just say, I'll tell one story. My, um, my main student when I had my yeshiva was a Dutch convert. And before he met me, um, he basically was, uh, he had taken on a much more Hasidic approach to his service of God. And he wore the hat, he wore the uniform, he had the peyote, he had the beard, the whole thing. And he was converting to a private Beit Din here in Eretz Yisrael. And, um, but it was a Beit Din that was sanctioned by the Rabbanut. So basically what would happen is when he was uh, getting his conversion through this Beit Din, they told him he should go to the Rabbanut and begin, open up a, a file and begin the process so that he could be accepted by the Rabbanut. And he walked into the, the first time for his first appointment. He walked into the Beit Din there, and he met with this one Dayan. It wasn't a Beit Din yet. He was just beginning the process of opening the file. And the Dayan asked him two questions. The first question was, do you respect the state of Israel. What this has to do with the process of conversion, please explain to me. But then the bet, the second question was even better. He looked at this young man wearing the long black coat and the flat black hat and the long peyote and the beard, and I kid you not, his second question was, do you celebrate Israeli Independence Day? Oh, wow. So my my student was was a very intelligent and capable of sarcastic sarcasm person. So he said back to this person, "Do I look like I'm the kind of person that <laughs> oh, is really independent?" You know, I'd like to make a point here on 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 both sides. On the one hand, because the rabbanut is for, it's, it's officially connected to the Israeli government. It's not, I mean, it's, there's a legal connection there. Um, right, correct. That's all there is. So I can reason. understand. That's the only reason the revenue has any value and it has any uh, authority at right. all is because so I, of that. I, I can understand them asking this, but it doesn't justify it as a valid, anything connected to the validity of that person as a proper, you know, acceptable potential convert. No, but, and, and therefore, but, you're being nice, but uh, yeah. But I mean, on, I but, just... No, but on the other hand, um, the state of Israel does represent to many people the the right of the Jewish people to live in the Jewish homeland, but then that would be a case of of semantics. Like he could he could of have course. expressed it in a less politicized way. Like that's what Zion, Zionism doesn't necessarily mean that you endorse the state of Israel as it is right now. It just means you're in, you're in favor of the right of a Jewish person to live in the Jewish homeland. Uh, correct. I mean, yeah. I, I do not endorse the state presently, and I feel very strongly Zionistic that I want the Jewish people to be here. I want there to be a Jewish state, meaning I do want Jews to be the bosses. I just want them to follow, you know, at least reason, if not Torah, rather than, you know, what we have today. But right. uh, even though I understand what you're saying, I would have to disagree that... Um, the point of the story was more to show that uh, of whether or not those questions should even be on the list of questions asked for them to be the first two questions that's preposterous beyond comprehension that that you know this young man walks in having a certain look it, the Dayan was not a young boy he was obviously somebody who had experienced right. life in Israel for many decades and he knew very well what a Hasidic looking boy looked like right and here was a young man walking in who was dressed Hasidic, and he chose, because it was his authority to choose, to ask questions that were beyond the pale of reason for what you would ask a prospective convert. Well, given the way that he looked, asking a question that would would expect a negative answer, one that would right, you know, he sort was of betray him as invalid. Failure. Right. Yeah, he was exactly. Convinced. Exactly. And this is the problem. I had the same is problem in, in Israel. I, I went to the Rabbanut I don't know how many times. Literally tens upon tens of times. I want to say nearly a hundred times over the duration of right. three years. Just to find out why I wasn't able to make Aliyah. And um, of course you can't work there legally unless you have citizenship and you're living there. So I needed to get citizenship. Right, and, and in order to get citizenship, you needed to have your your conversion accepted. Right, so my blah, conversion blah, blah, blah. was it was eventually accepted, but only with the help of a lawyer, and 
I didn't even have a clue as to what the issue was. Not because I hadn't asked. I had asked everybody in the Rabbanut. Right. And in the Mr. Rabbanim. No one told me what the issue was. It's not that they... It, it's not even that, like, it was... I don't know. It's just so absurd. I can't even... <laughs> I can't even right, it was believe like it didn't happened. Have a right, you did not have a right to know. Right. But then when I would go... But then when I would go... To, this is the, the catch point. When I would show them my papers at the Rabbanut, they would say, yes, you're Jewish. Of course, they would recognize me as Jewish orally when I was there physically. Right, but they Meaning, would never give you the... Right, but they exactly. would not tell me why they are not able to give a, um, a certification right. for it. Even though they knew. It just... Right. <laughs> they could have figured it out. Right. And this, this gets us back to, uh, you know, basically the issue of where we are today and why I believe, even though I, I will be honest in saying that the nation is not operating properly as the, the nation of Torah, still in all, I do believe that it has more to do with um, this problem that we're discussing and the situations that they arise really do point to why it is that there has to be a, a, a nation, a Torah nation, rather than just people who decide to come to serve God and therefore, you know, follow the dictates of the Torah, um, you know, on their own cognizance. But corruption is corruption is corruption, and even even a Torah state can be corrupted, and that's Absolutely. basically what we have today. So, but to get back to it, I basically, you know, the reason why I believe there has to be a Torah nation, meaning that God chose Avraham and his descendants, and they were given the task of becoming the, and I don't like to use the genetics so much, because I think almost genetics is almost an accident of it, but... Um, I think it's an accident that was not an accident, but more so a result of Christian and Islamic prohibition upon the Jewish people to accept converts for nearly 2,000 years. So it, uh, well, I, I would, they I, automatically I mean, became an ethnicity, multiple ethnicities. That, well, you have to remember that, first of all, that the nation of Israel existed for a long time before that right, happened. Right, but they accepted myriads of converts before that as well. And that's what I'm saying, is so that even if you were to say that uh, what you just said, the fact is, is that for half the nation's history, that those rules did not apply to them, and that we know that they brought in many, many, many converts. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously proof that even in Christian Europe, there were many converts. Brought That's believed to be them. only in the first few generations, at least up until. Uh, well, again, uh, let's put it this way: I find, you know, these things, even if it's only the first few generations, it was obviously a broad enough mixture that it wouldn't have mattered anymore, right. even if you stopped at some point, you know. Because I mean, here I am, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I believe that even though it's true what you're saying, that a, a substantial part of the Jewish of Jewish history did include a large intake of converts, but that is not the part of Jewish history that has most affected us in the present era. Uh, well, we're most, uh, we're most affected it. by two millennia of, of not accepting converts. And that's... Well, uh, again, I have, I have not seen... I have not seen uh, facts that say that that you know conversion dropped to some you know less than X percent oh. during that time. I'm, well, I'm assuming that it was. Much you don't harder. you don't need a specific number to know that it was <coughs> drastically less when both in, was, no, in Christianity got, no, and in Islam, you, Jewish. I mean, there are plenty of no, records no, I, saying that Jews Jewish communities would be they would be ransacked if no, people converted. Yeah, it was illegal. <laughs> Well, there, there. Let's put it this way: there are two ways that that convert blood can come into the nation. You're right. The fact is, obviously, that uh, I think certainly under Christian domination for many, many, many centuries, it, the number of actual converts was probably very small. On the other hand, this is also I why Jews have so many genetic issues. Well, and it's true. But on the other hand, I, I wouldn't. You know, I would also say that there obviously were mixtures of of genetics, if not through conversion, then through other acts, unseemly acts that basically, right. you know, brought in. But I was, I was, I mean, I, I was acting, or I was, uh, let's say, arguing against your statement from a different purpose. I, I don't, don't know, think which it, statement are you arguing against? The, a concept of the genetic mixture. In, in other words, when I said that I don't like using the term genetics, it's not because it isn't there, but because 
when I said it was an accident, I mean that it was it was the nation that was chosen as the loins from the loins of Abraham, not because of its genetics per se, but because of Abraham. And so the the concept was fixed in the Torah that there should be a nation that everything else revolves around or it, it has to operate in relation to. And I think it's very clear throughout the Torah that the plan of God was that this nation exist, the rules apply to the nation, and that everything else orients itself in relationship to this nation. Now, uh, that being the case, then we just have to ask ourselves or try to understand, you know, what was God's plan for the convert and, and or what do we know about how that operates? And, you know, second of all, what about the rest of humanity? How does the rest of humanity relate to this? And specifically for me, it boils down to uh, the place of the convert in, in the Torah and, you know, explaining how the laws shape that being. What is the place of a convert in the Torah, in your view? So, first of all, I believe 1,000% that the Torah is not bigoted or racist, and so therefore, obviously, the fact that converts, at least from a Torah point of view, are 100% allowed, except for those few cases that God outlined in the Torah, shows very clearly, first and foremost, that there is a process which allows for any human being that decides that their, their path must be to be as close to God as possible is allowed to join themselves to what, the Torah. Name. What people does the Torah prohibit from converting, even if it's a uh, exceptional case? Well, no, talking? specifically, yeah, we're talking like the seven Canaanite nations under right, certain. So where, where is that prohibited? Uh, well, we could look up. That's why I told uh, Asher that I wanted to do this a couple of days later because I hadn't gotten all my sources together. So you don't have to give a specific source. I'm pretty sure I know no, what we're referring know that, to. Yeah, you can no, paraphrase no, it. Exactly. Yeah, no, listen, it says, you know, first of all, that the seven nations are to be destroyed. We know very clearly that there was a certain a certain law which is discussed in the Talmud that if it was a male from the seven Canaanite nations that, uh, let's say, had a child with another any other nation, that that child is considered as part of the seven Canaanite nations which were to be destroyed. If it was a female Canaanite that had a child through anybody else, so then the child is considered to be of that nation of the father there was the prohibition against the egyptians until a certain uh, certain generation the prohibitions against male moabites so all of these and, all, all, all yeah. of these um past ideas that you're elaborating upon to. right now again i think we would both agree that you're paraphrasing it's not word for word what the torah says correct so what the torah correct. says with regard to these is it uses the wording that they should not enter into the into into the community. Kahal. Correct. Right. So, according to the Mishneh Torah, that isn't in reference to conversion, but rather it's in reference to marrying a native-born Israelite. And that that's the most straightforward meaning of the text, if you think about it. You don't even have to, and you don't even have to force some sort of weird interpretation on the text. Because if it were, for, if it were referring to simply conversion by the terminology enter into the community or the kaha um, if that were the case then what are you counting the number of generations from for example some of them it says after the second generation others it says uh, 10 generations and one it says like forever right but what right. are you counting so, it from so if if it's referring to um, to conversion at what point does that count begin but if it's refer and that remains ambiguous but if it's referring to um, marriage after having converted, well then it's clear where the count begins from the time that the father or grandfather converted, then a certain number of uh, generations later, then the person, the descendants of the, the original converts are able to marry native born Israelites. And that's the, what, that's the way well, that, that Rambam explains that, it. Right, but that, that, first of all, I'm not arguing against that, but that would only apply to Moabites and to the um, Amorites. It wouldn't apply to the Amalekites, or and it wouldn't why apply. Why wouldn't it? To, why wouldn't it apply? Because they're supposed to kill them all. Because they were, they, yeah, they were supposed to be destroyed. Okay, they so even even that them. is even that is different. At least okay, according to the second, well. go ahead. Right. I want to I want to bring up a different point though. But okay, um, the other point that has to be brought up is even so, even being what you said is true, 
then there obviously are two classes of convert because you're basically right. admitting that there is a convert who can become Jewish but is not allowed to become part of the nation. Well, he is a part so of the nation. He's not allowed to intermarry. In. No, I, what, right. Yeah, but okay, so that yeah, yeah there's a, a distinction. But, a, yeah, a big distinction, a huge yeah, distinction. Yeah, right. Because you know, again, I'm and not again, it's not genetic. It's not a genetic distinction because no, after yeah, a certain number of generations, true. then their descendants, after let's right. say For, two or four or whatever generations, they're still just as genetically that original yeah, but, person. But right. they've been I, a part of the Jewish people for a larger, a longer amount of time. Right. They've been and, a culture. And that, right, and that certainly just strengthens the idea of those people that think that there's some kind of genetic superiority that just knocks that down. Right, it's for sure not and, and genetic superiority. Have, right. I, I, it's cultural superiority. Problem, right. On the other hand, <laughs> we, we, we would have to answer... Um, certain questions in order to explain this subject fully like for instance why would it be therefore that if a person converts and we accept them a hundred percent into the nation why can't the female convert marry a Kohen right mm -hmm. why um, why specifically well, we know the why. Oral... <laughs> well uh, no I mean okay you can you can tell me I'm you know happy. why I'm assuming I've, I've... Tell me why. I mean, I'm ask, you know, I'm asking honestly. Why do you think that is? Well, because most... in other words, the question is, if a convert is accepted 100% into the nation, why are there these places that we see that limit the convert in certain? First ways? of all, like, limitations on on marriage doesn't have any bearing on the extent to which they are the validity of their being a part of the nation, because we know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not arguing that. I'm, I'm asking. I'm asking. There's certainly distinctions. To... I'm not just just. Uh, disputing that, but the distinctions exist only in the only in the first generation, or for a few generations for those specific seven nations. A hundred percent. Okay, 100%. but but when, when it comes to that particular example that you're giving about uh, a female convert not marrying a kohen, we both know that that's because she has a status of of being, you know, that she had had relations. Um, okay, so I, I, that's what I thought where you might going. I don't believe that. Uh, first of all, that's obviously a legal, that's legal language. Right. But well, that's the language I mean, that the Talmud uses. I, I think, and the prohibition is entirely right. in the context of rabbinic law. It's not, I'm not exactly. saying it's rabbinic words, law, but Torah, it's, it's a rabbinic No, the Torah idea. doesn't say that. Right. The Torah doesn't say In other words, I personally believe that, um, how should I say this? I think that we could actually explain that categorically different if we're just looking at the Torah over using the Talmudic language. Meaning, it may be that the, the, the sages of the Talmud said this idea, but that doesn't actually explain what the Torah in, in, intended. I don't believe that God is, is basically saying, oh, you know, because we have to assume that every female convert is, is not a virgin, so you know, then that's why we have to prohibit I don't, the Kohen from. I don't think that's what's going. I on. also don't I think, think that everything in in, the, in Talmudic literature is is immutable by nature. I think that okay. some of those right. things so, can be changed within certain frameworks, but obviously it has to be within a proper legal framework, which we've right. been deprived for right. two thousand years. And, and, so, and, right. Right, and I want to keep uh, well at a time that. That it was common among certain peoples for for females to have been even young girls to have been you know sexually abused or whatever that would make more sense. But in another culture, in a more modern culture, well, even in modern cultures, it sometimes happens. But but we both know that even among non-Israelites, cultures vary both from time to time and also oh, from course, location. Because I, man, like I said, that's why, first of all, I mean, I want to reiterate something. I do not in any way, shape, or form condone the idea amongst a person that how you were born or where you were born has any spiritual effect on you, except for the personal effect that you might have to deal with certain things right. in your growth yeah. with Hashem. Uh, you know, I love and that can also be genetic. I mean, Gen it can genetics be genetic. are, are a reality. <laughs> now look, I mean, anybody anybody who ignores the reality that you know some of our, I mean, you know, look at David Melech for God's sake. I mean, you know, he was born fully into the you know tribe of Yehuda, and and you know, and he.
he had his personal issues that he had to overcome and grow and he had to do chuva before God. I mean, you know, the whole idea that that today this this concept has been and, and it's almost disgusting is the word I would use, you know, when I when I have been involved with discussing with people this issue of converts versus born Jews and, you know, people bring out these ideas about you know, somehow trying to evaluate or give a value to somebody just because one was born from the womb of a Jewish mother and another was born from the womb of a non-Jewish mother. I mean, it's beyond comprehension. On the other hand, I think what I was trying to do was not argue the legal issue to separate the convert out, but just to show that even though they become 100 percent part of the nation, there are still certain rules which apply and what I was hoping to do was try and give over a brief idea of why that has to be that way, okay. which again strengthens the idea of the nation. Okay, go ahead. So I basically want to say, like, and this is this is a very grossly general way of looking at it, but I believe that the case can be made for it, that once God chose a nation, that there had to be a nation. And even though because he's God and he understands that all of humanity is his creation, he in more than one way opened the door for people to come cleave to him. Insofar as a person decides to cleave to the nation, the rules um, governing that person's interaction with the nation have to always be aimed at guarding the nation to stay the nation. And so I believe that actually you can explain these various rules that apply to converts as showing very clearly that they're actually their only purpose is to protect the status of the nation, that it should remain, retain a certain cohesion as a nation. That was the ultimate original plan. Now, whether or not that still exists because of certain things that happen, that's another question. But ultimately that when a person becomes a convert, the reason why they cannot become king the reason why a female convert cannot marry a Kohen, but her her daughter can. The reason, you know, all these things are actually aimed very simply at always creating the borders or boundaries under which the nation is to remain a nation. I don't think that's anything particularly unique to the people of Israel. It may not be, but I believe that that's what, why it had to be that way. Right, but In also words, when you say nation, I mean, a nation, again, like on the one hand, you say that it's it's not really such a genetic issue, but on the other hand, like when you say nation, there are different types of nations, but you can have a nation which is not limited or in any way um, based upon, in the present, based upon uh, uh, lineage. It may be Correct. based upon originally on a certain particular family, but he, like and th that's really what I think is the case with the people of Israel. I well today see it. I agree with Go you ahead. because you see the ten tribes have you know totally disappeared, right? I right. Mean, in other words, we have this idea, and I agree. With I think you that there. that's all that it was for was to establish this nation. But I also I I, I totally agree with you regarding um, that, for example, the whoever is a king, he should be from among the people of Israel. I don't think it has to be someone who's genetically from the people of Israel, but it's not no, supposed to be like a, 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 a second a second generation convert could be right. They don't even have to be a descendant of King David. They only have to be a descendant of King David to be a part of a dynasty. No, I understand that, but I'm saying that any any second generation, you know, born right, of a right. convert and an Israelite can become a king. No question about it. But that in and of itself, that structure already, I believe, is fundamental in establishing. Uh, the anchors that would normally keep the nation the nation, even though I actually agree with you that today the state of the nation is absolutely and fundamentally different than what it was originally set up. I don't think it's completely different, but it's, it's, it's pretty substantially, well, it's substantially different. <laughs> we, don't, we don't live in tribal organizations. You know, right. The fact is that even though I do believe that there probably are, quote, genetically... Uh, every tribe is represented in the people that have survived as it's as, not organized along those lines it, it's and, I, and it, it's not organized and there's no way of ascertaining it you know and then there's this concept of whether or not miraculously 
we'll go back to that. But I really not. think that the entire point of that was simply for the purpose of um, governmental rule in, in a sense of like jurisdictions, like counties okay, in the United you, States. You, or, even you, so, I still believe that fundamentally relates to the concept of nation, uh, Torah nation as a nation. Right. I mean, I, I, and, and you see I in the book of Ezekiel that, that the converts who live in those particular places are counted among the particular tribe in which they dwell. So already from the book of Ezekiel, yeah, you see right. that. Right, and Ezekiel even says, I only actually stumbled across this, I mean, I, embarrassedly, I'll admit recently, that, you know, basically when when the redemption occurs, that, you know, converts will be adopted into tribes exactly. and actually be given full. But ultimately, that's only then. It's not. It wasn't back in the day. Right. So I, I think that's a proof that there was a need to establish. Well, they still existed with a clear identity at that, in, in history. Right. And the nation had to as well. And so that's why I, I argue against this concept that the, the nation doesn't matter, that it's only the person who cleaves to God, even though obviously the person cleaving to God is of primary importance vis-a-vis. Uh, well, I don't know if we had a dispute from the outset in any case with regard to that. I also believe... We that, haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do believe that the people of Israel are a nation. I just don't think that it's a nation in which um, ancestral heritage, like physical ancestry, is paramount to the extent that it is today. I think it is paramount for specific offices, and I think that's useful, offices such as king or high priest, and I think that's, that's important to establish the historicity, the historical validity of the nation throughout all history to come. But in a general sense, I, I think it has very little significance. Well, let's put it this way. I wouldn't argue that except for, and then we can get into this concept, which I mentioned before, of people today who have tried to establish a, a concept that you don't even have to be, quote, Jewish to be Jewish. Well, what did you mean? I don't even know what you mean. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying that, you know, like I said, uh, I know at least uh, several people I have heard essentially state the idea that if a person accepts the Torah upon themselves, then they are every bit as part of Israel as a born Israelite, and there is no necess necessary uh, conversion to join the nation. I think that's uh, true, but not not in a functional or practical sense. I think it's true... Yeah, in, in other words, you're saying philosophically. And, I think it's know, true philosophically, yeah. but if, I, okay. if they want to and live it out, then they will make it formal. It needs right, to, and that, that, that's my point. I agree with you. Obviously... Uh, you can't just create all, your own otherwise people could just create their whole like what you were talking about they could create sort of like an alternative Israel or something <laughs> right well basically yeah and actually it, which is no it, different from what Christianity has done in some sense essentially 100% I mean there know, are whole is, Christian denominations that really emphasize the idea that they are the new Israel correct uh, you know and uh, yeah. I mean I've had conversations with, with these people uh, I did like a three-month investigation of the black Hebrews, for instance, and, you know, they also are a people who basically claim that history is all a lie and that, you know, they're the true Israel. And, and, and yet whatever you know, little I bit they know about Hebrew, they got from Jews. <laughs> and they just well, added, I, I, they added uh, unnecessary right, vowels I, here and there. But <laughs> Right. I tried, I tried to, you know, yeah, I tried Hawashi. to point that out. Right. I tried to point that out upon occasion. And. You know, I was called a son of Esau, yeah, or yeah, yeah. A, son, a son of the devil. And the only reason know. they know Esau exists is because Jews preserve the Bible. <laughs> right, 100%. I mean, this it's is, hilarious. you know, it's absurd. it is hilarious. But basically, so I agree with you, and I think that you raise an amazingly important point, and that is that if it were not for the concept within the Torah that keeps... There's obviously a shift over time. There have been tremendous shifts in the, I would even say, in the spiritual outlook of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Torah. The Torah allows for these things because God created the world and he understands, obviously understood and understands the nature of man. On the other hand, certain things must maintain, a, a, a certain framework must continue to exist. And part of the problem, I believe, in the whole conversion process today is because of the negative side of that structure is being stressed instead of instead of the positive side. In other words, instead of 
bringing people into Israel to become part of Israel, many of these rabbis are looking at non-Jews that want to convert as, you know, we're, we're perfect because we're Israel and you're not because you're not. But that's not what was meant. That's obviously not what God meant. Um, you know, so obviously I, not, not the reality. I mean, it is the reality what you said that that's how many behave, but it's not the, I mean, clearly the people of Israel are not perfect. <laughs> No, no, the people of Israel are not perfect, yeah. and, you know, the fact is, is that uh, um, this idea is just gross beyond comprehension that people should, you know, think they have a right to be, I mean, for a Jew to be, show bigotry or race, or any kind of racist attitude to me is is almost such an affront to God's creation. I mean, we have so many statements in the Torah and the Talmud the Which, entire you know, Jewish people are made up of converts. I mean, it's no, true exactly. that that's, that's it's true. Right. It's true that the Jewish people or the people of Israel were established by the family of Abraham. But all but, along, you see, especially in the first generations, it's emphasized. Uh, first gener the, Russia, there were more. There were more non-Jewish people, quote unquote. Course, I mean, it didn't even exist as a Jewish nation by that first name. Of all, but the, more the of them were non-Jewish women yeah. joining than there were yeah. men. Like and all the these wives. <laughs> In the first three generations, we have one female being born. Between Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Yaakov had one daughter. That's it. So obviously, where did I, so of course everybody will quote the famous midrash, but you know basically that's just foolishness. And and I I always trot out Rashi. Rashi says very clearly in Shemot, on the pasuk that mentions Shaul ben Hakananit. Rashi says very clearly that the men of the tribes married Egyptian women, Midianite women, but they had a rule that they would not marry Canaanite women. And so basically he's showing right there that, you know, this this idea that uh, they didn't marry outside the tribe is foolishness because, you know, Midrash notwithstanding, there were no women mentioned as being born that they, they could marry. They didn't reproduce in the manner of amoeba asexually. <laughs> Correct. And, it had to come from just, somewhere. <laughs> right. And this just obviously continued for, you know, from that point on, it always continued. Um, so, yes, I agree with you. And I think that uh, my dream for the nation would be that, you know, we would get leaders that could actually begin reversing some of these horrible stereotypes that have, you know, gotten so strong in our nation that, that uh, first of all, fixing the conversion process so that it's reasonable, you know, second of all, national education so that we could actually make sure that people really understand what being part of the nation of Israel is. It's not genetic, it's not locks and cream cheese, but it's, you know, moral ideas and it's following the commands in the Torah. Nothing against cream cheese. Right, right, nothing against locks or cream cheese. But, it, and this, I, and I agree with I you. I don't like these, locks. Right, these <laughs> movements, these movements that get started are started in, in the vacuum of negative, um, you know, trends that create the backlash, uh, as has often happened in our nation. Uh, Hasidus got started because of a very negative, you know, period in history when um, there were it, there was elitism amongst the Jews that learned Torah in Europe. And then it turned into what it originally opposed. Uh, exactly, it became the most elitist movement, right? And that, that there's an irony there too, but that's for another discussion. So, basically, you know, to try to recap up to what we said today is, I believe that a there is a nation, there's supposed to be a nation, but that the Torah, first and foremost, is an open book to everybody that wishes to join it. That's those two are fundamental beliefs, right? That nobody should, nobody but nobody should automatically be rejectable from joining up with the nation. Then, like I said, the, the third thing is, if all of this is the case, so what about humanity? Where does humanity fit into the, fit into this? Um, I think, so I'm going to, again, say what I believe after my years of study. I do not believe that the plan is that the entire set of humanity should convert to become Israel. I think it's pretty clear from the books of the prophets that that's not destined to happen. And that opens the door to, okay, well, if that's the case, so if all these people are not going to become Israel, so what are they supposed to do? 
And I think that uh, here mostly it's logic because uh, for whatever reason, God said very little about this except for one or two verses. I think it's pretty clear that it's about the concept of perfection under God, meaning that once a person accepts and understands that God created, that there is a God and he created, and he created with a plan, the idea is that each person should be shown or on their own come to understanding how they could possibly fit into that plan. And um, whether you call it the Sheva Mitzvot Ben Noach or however you, you approach that, it's really very simple. It's about accepting God in one's life and figuring out what actions are acceptable to God and what actions aren't acceptable to God. So the, the main think, way I would, I would uh, disagree with that yeah. is that when someone decides that they want to live according to God's will, if they are seeking it with intellectual honesty and they have resources available, I see absolutely nothing that would hold them back from joining the people of Israel. Meaning, I, that's not to say that everyone in the world would or should become Jewish, but of those who truly seek to mold and conform their life to God's will to the extent of their ability, I don't see any reason why they would not do that by joining the people of Israel. Otherwise, they're and just creating their own personal philosophy, and the Torah never recognizes no, it. It's nowhere in the Torah. Not, one second. So first of all, I, I don't disagree with you, except I think that what you're doing is you're kind of um, promoting uh, a perfectionist attitude, which isn't, which isn't um, reasonable, meaning what you said, which I fully agree with, is that a person who feels that they they wish to be the pinnacle of God's plan in this world, okay, I would agree with you. They probably are going to want to become part of Israel. No, not the pinnacle. Just to conform their life to God's will to the best okay, of their ability. Okay, that's what. That's a, but the thing is, the question is, are they uh, is a human being obligated to do that or? Is there a state where they could exist, where they conform to that which God would command of them without becoming part of Israel? And I think that there is. Right. So we have I, to find where that is in the Torah. Well, well, that so, and and I, I, that's why I said logic because I do believe that there are a few statements in the Torah which show um, the path. But uh, even though I happen to be a firm believer in Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach. I think that ultimately uh, it's not quite as set out as, let's say, even the Rambam documents. Are, are those paths from before or after the Torah was given in the Torah? Both. I think that that's the whole point of the Torah is to show, uh, to give the, the options and opportunity for people to investigate for themselves what it would mean to accept the God, God the Creator in their life. For example, with Abraham, although the Torah wasn't yet given, he submitted to whatever instruction God had available to him at the time, which is why, in seems to me, why in the Aramaic uh, paraphrase, and I try to avoid using the Hebrew for whoever's listening, <laughs> in, 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 the, in the Aramaic paraphrase, you know, Onkelos, why he's called Jewish. Actually, several of them are called Jewish even though they weren't yet Jewish, because they were embracing God's will to the extent of their ability. Well, and I do believe that that's ultimately what the person has to strive for. The question is, what does that mean in action? And um, so... Uh, I don't think most way. people do it, and I don't think they no, uh, most people well, ever uh, will. <laughs> first of all, that, that brings up something else that I wanted to mention to counter your statement. You said that Basically, the, the the idea is that if a person truly recognizes God's existence and the fact that he gave the Torah, then it, one would be hard-pressed to understand why they wouldn't accept the need to convert. And I'll tell you why. No, 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 I just, that's not my view. My view is... I thought that's what you said. No, no, everything okay. you said, plus, and they want, from their own will, they want to conform their life to God's will. The mere fact that someone acknowledges... Or is okay, aware. Uh, uh, that, yeah. that doesn't mean that they necessarily want to. 
That's right, completely but now, different. Uh, 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 the thing is, is that in that desire to conform to God's will, if they see that in reality, even the nation doesn't achieve that, in your eyes, would that mitigate their their uh, drive to actually join the nation of Israel? In no, other words, God, God's will isn't that we do everything perfectly. You, the 613 commandments don't apply to each and every individual, no, and course. it takes into and it takes into account the fact that we will make mistakes. We will not live up to perfection. The Torah doesn't demand perfection; it demands no, an aim. Right, but what if what if I, as a non-Jew, realize that, uh, let's say you're talking about an intelligent person that deliberates very carefully, he investigates, you know, the Kuzari of okay. today. Yeah. He he comes to Israel, he investigates, he talks to people in Meisharim and people in Herzliya and people in the various other communities. He goes to the Rabbanim of the Rabbanut, and he basically comes to the realization, oh my gosh. These people are the people of God, but you know they're Bakoshi holding on to the Torah themselves. But they're doing a much better job than everyone else I've been around and seen. Oh no, no, no. that I don't. I'm not <laughs> arguing that point. I'm just saying, what if this person said, "Yeah, for me personally, my service of God, as I understand it, would be much, which be much more likely to be successful if I don't join myself to this nation, but I just choose to serve God." I would simply ask him, where do you find that in the Torah? You have to show a place. Where do you, where, well, he's he's learned the Torah, so he's learned Hebrew, he's learned the mm -hmm. Torah, so he'll respond to you and say, where do you see that I have to join? Where does it say that I'm obligated to join? It doesn't. In no, other it, words, just, what, it just restricts the blessings to the people of the covenant. Well, it doesn't say that there aren't blessings to anybody else. It just says that there there, there are certain blessed things. In other words... Right, so you have no promise no from the Torah. You, it would just be pure speculation. No, but what promise... Again, as an individual... I'm not talking about the nation of Israel. I'm saying as an individual, what promise do any of us have outside of our service of God? We have no promise. Okay, so, so he's serving God too. Yeah, so why should? But our the promise we have within the context of the service of God is according to the Torah of God. But in with that individual, his belief of blessings within the service of God, without joining the covenant, has absolutely no standing on anything other than just so, a supposition. So, so you're gonna you're gonna say that this this. God of the Torah that we've been talking about since this conversation started, mm -hmm. where everything is thought out and, and organized in a certain role, and the purpose of it is to bring people to serve God, mm -hmm. you're basically now saying, yeah, but he kind of just decided that these people that decide to serve him but don't join up for the nation for whatever reason, they're like they're the ones that are on the outside. They're just like totally ignored. There's no benefit to them. Nothing comes to them. I'm saying that if any benefit does come to them, it's not based on the Torah. Okay, I, I think that that's a fundamentally flawed idea. I, I understand we that We have you're... to prove our words. I mean, I, I personally do believe that they can get blessings and benefit without no, formally think, well, converting, but I would also acknowledge that that belief of mine is not based on the Torah. Well, I, I, is logic part of the Torah? As so long as it conforms to the Torah. Okay, so, okay, good. So okay, let's take a different tack. Did Abraham achieve blessings? Abraham achieved a uh, promise of blessings. From... No, he also achieved blessings. I think it's pretty clear. Okay. Correct? Yeah, but he, he he achieved it with prophecy, the same you know prophecy, no, no, no. which is the basis uh, yeah, but of I'm the saying Torah. That <laughs> if, if somebody asked you, if somebody asked you, and they said, you know, was did Abraham gain heavenly blessing from God? Yeah, if Isaac is a part of that, then sure. No, I mean, in other words, uh, we have this concept within the Torah. I don't believe it's beyond God's ability. I just deny that the Torah teaches these blessings. The Torah does not promise these blessings to other people, and it, I, I think it's disingenuous to say that it does. We can say that with logic, as, as you have said a few times, with logic it would seem that it should, and perhaps it does, but we can't say that this is based on the Torah. It may be based on our well, looking between the texts. 
right? So if, if so, if that's the case, then I would say that uh, I, in, in, if I accept your statement, then I'll say then it seems like God pretty much just left the rest of humanity out of the whole thing. In other words, you know, what, where exactly in the Torah does God call out to the nations of the world, to all of humanity, to come join His Torah? And where? where with the nations that they're given the option to abandon their idolatry whenever they no, are conquered by the people of Israel. For, where does it say that in the Torah, actually? That's that's all oral law, actually. No, 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 no. There's It's explicit in the Torah that they're called to peace. It doesn't only say that... There, everybody, for some reason, remembers the <laughs> commandment to, like, obliterate these nations, but the Torah itself, in the written text, not just in the oral tradition, says, explicit, explicitly gives a call to to peace to those same nations they're only to be obliterated if they don't accept this peace and abandon the idolatry in that context together with the other passages where okay one second know, no, before you go on with that let, let, okay for the moment let's just let's accept that as a given okay so therefore god says if you just establish peace with israel that's all i ask of you right but it has to be within the framework of the torah meaning Within what does the that mean? Wait, wait, within the framework of the Sanhedrin, which was established within the framework of the seven laws of Noah as a bare minimum for being allowed to live in the land of Israel, then yes. But that's only within the land of Israel, and that's certainly not, you know, they're not no, even allowed. So. Go ahead. I'm just saying, you're, you're basically saying that there's no call for people to join the Torah. They just have to live in peace with the nation of Israel under the Torah, whatever that means to you. Right, but these but, are people who are not seeking to do God's will. They're just seeking to not have to flee. <laughs> right, that's another thing. In other words, so this is a different. This is clearly distinct from who we've been speaking so this about isn't before. The right, this isn't the universal call. That's this true. Is just a particular. Right. right, but it's it's sort of like prodding them in that direction. Right, because they they would have been here in the land. The right. point being that that you, if you're going to try to expand that to apply to the whole entire of we humanity, have the text. You have the text in the Torah where it says that the nations will see you and they will consider you wise. What an amazing God! Good. Wise and there's God, the right? there's the there's the famous one which obviously is quoted all the time of you know that you'll be. You'll be Am Kohanim, you know, and or or you know or Logoim. I mean, all of these statements, but ultimately these statements are so vague in terms of the practical what it means that you're going to be hard pressed. Well, what does the Quran teach? Well, that's the question. I, I would say he just teaches the existence of God and the need for a person to avoid that which is evil in God's eyes. Right, so, so I would I would say he teaches the Torah because that's the okay, that would be that could be the same thing. But the question is, when you say that, do you mean that he teaches you have to put on tefillin, you have to say Shema before three hours, you have to keep Shabbat thirty nine malachot, and you know, I mean, in other words, this is where it gets into the nitty gritty of exactly no, that the what nation that comes to you, the nation that sojourns among you, there will be one law for you and for him. The only exception. Yeah, but, Go ahead. No, but that's only the nation that comes to join jo to live amongst you. What about? What about the you know two billion Chinese and the, you know the you know one billion Indians? I mean, let's say that they're perfectly happy living in Ceylon and Sri Lanka. And, yeah, they don't. Know, I don't. I don't believe India. that they have to convert. But if they want to do God's will, then they will draw from the Torah, unless they just want to make stuff up. No, but again, draw from the Torah. I don't have a problem with the question is what are they drawing from the Torah? What are they choosing to do? Right. Well, they're gonna mix and match and create their own little idea their own little sub religion yeah let, let's say let's say, no again let's 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 talk about the on the level of perfection you know a, a group of people in china become aware of the creator of the universe and in investigating they come to realize that the only logical um history that makes any sense to them is the history of the nation of israel the giving of the Torah. I mean, and we could talk about what proofs one can marshal to right. make this claim, but for the moment, that's that's for a different discussion. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying, let, let's say that they come to that moment, and they say, wow, there is a creator of the universe. 
He did give a book of law to Moshe, who was a descendant of Abraham. This nation has weathered the the um, you know calamities of history and has carried that Torah with them. And here they are today in 2017. This is the and we're law. allowed to join them. Gotcha. And why wouldn't we? No, and let's say that they say, well, <laughs> why would I they live, not want to? Because they live in Beijing, and because well, you don't Israel have to live in the land of Israel to be Jewish. You don't have to. Uh, well, uh, actually, let's put it this way. Uh, for the moment, I'm going to say, like I said before, they could look around and they could say, okay, what calls me? Uh, tell you what, call call it a theoretical discussion. Put aside for the moment the idea that you believe that anybody who comes to this point would obviously have to convert. Because they don't again, have I, to convert. I they'd want to. No, I mean, when I say have to, I mean that they would feel no other recourse. Okay. But to okay. Assuming that it's not the crazy I mean, conversion I have my own of today. Right. Against that, right. Assuming, to, assuming you know, that they're that they're. I mean, of course, if they're faced with the type of conversion that is common today, then I can well, completely again, yeah. understand the recourse being it's better that I just sort of make up my own little thing. Right. But we're talking about like if they're actually going to be accepted as by decent human beings and treated as decent human beings. Right. So okay. the question is what what would the Torah how would does the Torah say anything, teach them anything that would lead them to be able to achieve this state? That's the question. What state? To the state of Jewish living or? in perfection, living in perfection, not as a Jew, but as an acceptor of the God of Israel. I am totally unaware of such a passage. Well, I don't think it's one passage. I think it's basically, like you said before, I would say it's the entirety of the Torah. Meaning, just like Abraham, this is basically what I fundamentally believe Abraham did. He he did not have the Torah. He did not have prophecy in the sense that, you know, God sent him a message. This is what you should do and this is what you should not do. Because his, his test was specifically to see what is Abraham going to do in the vacuum of the Torah and the lack of Torah. And I believe that if, for instance, if you if you learn, say, from Bereshit, then you begin to see that in actuality there is a moral code of justice and good deed which is very clear in the Torah which is essentially mitzvah and I believe that in actuality this is really what the Sheva Mitzvah Ben Noach is based on that a person could intuit and divine very that a person could what? Over. what to it? I didn't hear the word in, intuit and divine meaning that if they look at the Torah and they see what the Torah says to do and then it, it basically there's two things that come out of every action that we're given there's the specific action and then there's the result of it okay so for instance uh, you know I do not believe that if a person puts on tefillin they become a more moral person just because they put on no. tefillin <laughs> if they contemplate the meaning of tefillin and the concept of Torah and what Torah is supposed to result in then they can become a more moral person Right. So therefore, I believe that if a person is not commanded to put on tefillin, but they learn about the Torah of tefillin, then they could in, they could come to the same result of realizing that they have to be, achieve a certain moral standing in order to stand before God and not be embarrassed. That kashrut, that all the laws of the Torah create a paradigm of moral standing, justice, avoidance of evil. Uh, rejection of idol worship, all these things, they just flow naturally from the Torah. And like unto Avraham, a person in this state could say, uh, and again, the reasons why they wouldn't join, you know, we could argue about that they should or shouldn't, but ultimately that I do believe that if a person stands and says at the end of their life that they avoided evil, they battled against evil, they lived a moral life, that the moral life that the Torah taught them, and they sought therefore to fulfill the will of God, that they will be accepted as they're doing exactly that to the best of their human ability. And I think that's very clear. What the, that's that's the ultimate goal of the Torah. God doesn't want the actions specific to the Taryag mitzvot alone. He wants a result from that, and the result from that is something that can be achieved because one sees. What the Torah teaches. Well, you're referring to are the ethical type of values that are expressed in the Torah that are reinforced by the the more ritual type commandments. 
Correct. Right. So I do believe that people without Torah can come to sort of ethical understanding, but I don't. Well, I think this is with the Torah. Sure. With well, okay, the with the Torah. The but I don't. Torah. I, I don't see any any nation um, maintaining. And I agree with you. I don't see any nation maintaining uh, for any significant period of time ethical values without certain unique cultural structures that reinforce those values, which is possible. I mean, there's one of the theories as to the purpose for the holidays and, and kosher laws as a means to sort of keep us distinct from other peoples. But when you break that down, then you have you've also broken down sort of the safeguards that maintain this ethical nation that forms. Yeah, but oh, so for, there's two things here that you're mentioning, which I do believe are important. But so the first of all, this person doesn't have to be concerned with the nation. He only has to be concerned with himself. Well, if if in so in so far as obviously he wants to do the good of God, and so therefore he's going to reach out to help as exactly. many people as possible. On the other hand, again, he's not his his job is not to perfect the world. His job is to make sure that he is right with God. No different than a Jew. Right. As a Jew, I am bound to my nation. That does not mean that I have an obligation to give up my life to run around trying to make everybody else a little better. Everything fits within the context of what's what one is capable of doing. You know, and um, what I'm saying here is that it seems to me you're, you're on a certain level agreeing with this, that because you're basically saying, well, if one wants to be part of the eternal nation, one has to do X. And I agree. No, not just the, the other hand, If you want to influence the society around you, it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice yourself. But if, no, one, but, one, uh, if uh, one wants to contribute to constructing a ethical society that will last, you need certain safeguards in place beyond just the bare uh, ethical And I agree aspects. with you, but I, I do believe that today, and actually I believe within Jewish philosophy, there is a recognition that sometimes that's just not really achievable. The job of the Jew, obviously, he has no choice on some levels because he's part of the nation of Israel, you know. But the fact is, is that even the Rambam says that if you live in a society that's totally corrupted, run out to the desert. Yep. What does he mean? That's, that's if you can't find some other nation to join, which would be positive. He also says that. In which case, right, these people again, would join the people of Israel rather than be in a desert. Why? All because by what if the, I'm sorry, but excuse me, but the people of Israel are not evidencing any great um, moral majority here at the moment. Now, <laughs> there are the people of Israel. I do think that are, I do think the people of Israel are particularly moral, especially in their region of the world. I don't think that they are the pinnacle of morality that we should strive for, but. Relatively speaking, I do think they are among the more moral of the world. Yeah, but you just said it. Relatively speaking, great. Yeah. Relatively speaking, but the fact of the matter is, is that. Uh, but uh, again, but again, it's not the Torah nation at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> right, and so that's my point: is that this person, you know, might might truly come to recognize. Listen, I, I, I'm sure he would feel a certain amount of of pain that you know there isn't. A, a group to join but I could fully understand if looking at the situation as it was he said well I mean you know there's a famous midrash that that I'll use in the opposite context not everybody was not everybody was created to have the nature to say better to be the the handmaiden to Abraham than the queen in Egypt you know the fact of the matter is is that um, I could very clearly I've seen it I've seen it in certain people for them to give up everything that they have and to come and be, you know, downtrodden and spit upon and mistreated and, and not only that, but recognize the fact that they might not, you know, really they can't they can't guarantee that their children are going to be able to say, wow, I'm a I'm part of the nation of Israel. That's amazing. Because, you know, in other words, uh, let's face it, when we see a lot of negativity and we see a lot of incorrect behavior. Um, you know, we, I feel it, you know, I say, listen, I'm part of the nation and I accept that, but that doesn't make, always make me happy when I see, you know, behavior that's less than noble and, you know, or even disgusting, you know, and I have to put up with it and I see it affect my children and I see it affect the children around me and I see it affect people who try and, you know, willingly convert and become part of this nation and then they're like, you know, looked down upon or worse. 
I, I personally, you know, think very strongly that God can't possibly have demanded of all of these people that they absolutely sacrifice their lives to come, you know, live in that situation. I don't think that God demands it. I just don't. Okay. I just no, don't. I, Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, okay, he doesn't demand it, therefore there has to be an avenue open. No, it I'm just saying that there's no other divinely revealed um, I agree. Guide, I agree guidelines by which to follow. No, I agree, and I think that the person has to, has to, uh, to some level, it's going to take grasping the Torah. Part of the thing that I love about the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach is that, uh, at least the way the Rambam words it, even though he seems to be limiting it, uh, limiting it, the fact is is that the Torah that applies to their mitzvot is open to them. Obviously, the Torah is the book that anybody and any nation, any group of people should be using to produce this result that God wants of us. This is why I, I feel so sad for my own nation, because they were actually given the book and they virtually ignore it for all sorts of, you know, much more recent and not so necessarily tied to the Torah ideologies that they've created to, you know, to guide them. You know, I've, I've become, in, in the last few years, I've become like uh, what I would call a dyed-in-the-wool nationalist Torahnik, meaning I, I fundamentally reject philosophies that are, you know, only a few hundred years old that are based on picking a couple of points from the Torah and making that the totality of their effort. But no, there's only one book, there's only one philosophy, it's the philosophy of Torah. That's what we need to be following. Amen. And, you know, so, and yeah, I mean, uh, you know, very, I feel very strongly about this. I, th I, think, uh, I think that was a good place to wrap it up. <laughs> I think so too, because it's about two o'clock in the morning for me. Oh so. my gosh! <laughs> All right, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Okay, yeah, two o four. I was I wasn't I'm even looking so at sorry. this. No, no, no! Don't apologize. I loved it. I it's enjoyed it very much. And I, <laughs> right, I want to um, you know, I as I said to Asher earlier. I mean, I, you know, I, I've been wanting to get back to doing this for a long time. I enjoyed our first. Did you record this, by the way? It's supposedly recording, but I can't promise you. Okay, well, whatever, we'll see. If not, I mean, because I, I mean, I think for you know, I also can set up. On I think own it's computer. valuable for people to hear. I, I really. Oh, a hundred percent, and I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of important points here, and I think that these are the dialogues that we have to be having. Yeah, without without yelling and ridiculous. Correct. A hundred percent. Thank you so much. I, I'd like to continue these conversations with you Guys, I don't in the understand. future. Okay. Amen, amen. Chazak, Baruch. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> yeah. Yalla. Naimod. Okay. Bye-bye. Kotum Lailato. Shalom. Bye. Bye.